this month, some of that. Love it. Uh, Tom studied for his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and has since become a long-standing faculty member at Bucknell University, where in 2013 he held the title of Presidential Professor of Physics. Uh, over his career, he studied a wide range of physical phenomena and processes related to chaotic motion, pattern formation, and turbulence. And recently, and what we'll be hearing more about today, he's been working on how flow shapes and coherent structures influence mixing and access systems. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, Tom, and I'll give you a poke around the 40-minute mark. Cool, cool. Thanks, for, thanks, Richard. I, I appreciate you guys inviting me to participate in this. Uh, uh, these microscale ocean uh, biophysics uh, um, series sounds really, really pretty cool, and so it's fun for me to kind of participate in this. Um, so as uh, as uh, Richard mentioned, my work is all has been all about mixing, um, uh, both chaotic mixing and then more recently mixing of active um, uh, active tracers. And in particular, in this talk, we're going to be describing both swimming microbes, basically how fluid flows affect swimming microbes, and also reaction fronts as well. And the, the real kind of key point that I want to make throughout the talk is that these two systems are really quite similar. And in fact, um, a, a, an idea that goes through all of this is this idea of manifolds as barriers for active mixing. Um, both for reaction fronts and for self-propelled tracers. Now, before I go any farther, I need to highlight all these students who have been working on these projects over the years. Um, at Bucknell, um, I've been working entirely with undergraduate students and, and, and just, a, a, just an amazing, amazing group of undergraduate students who have been doing all these experiments here. And we have also been collaborating, collaborating with Kevin Mitchell and his research group at the University of California at Merced. So you'll be seeing a lot of his stuff in here as well. Um, so um, I like to subtitle this talk, actually, I think it was the actual title, um, How is a Swimming Microbe Like a Forest Fire? Um, these, at first glance, look like very, very different systems. And yet it turns out that actually there is a lot of common physics and dynamics going on with these two systems here. So I want to start off, um, this may be background that you guys are already familiar with, but if not, um, just comment on what we mean by active matter or active systems. Generally, the condensed matter um, uh, community defines active matter as some sort of a system with some sort of internal energy source. A lot of studies on these uh, active liquid crystals and kinesin and microtubules. Um, of course, self-propelled organisms are an example of an active matter system. Um, you can talk about synthetic split swimmers like Janus particles as an example, or these quinky rollers or things like that. And of course, you can talk about uh, larger scale systems, birds, fish. One of the cool things, one of the many, many cool things about active systems is that you can also get some really cool um, collective behavior as well. Um, I also want to emphasize, since this is a micro scale ocean biophysics seminar, that one significant application is when we're talking about algae blooms. And I want to emphasize, of course, when you're talking about al uh, blooms of plankton, some plankton are motile and some plankton are, are less so. But even the ones that are not motile, um, you can still get basically front producing uh, behavior because of the fact that these guys are reproducing. Um, and so um, we're going to come back to this picture later on. It turns out that there's a lot of features in this picture that are very similar to our experiments. Um, there are lots and lots of applications. I think I probably, this is one audience I probably don't have to say this to because you probably, you guys are probably well aware of all these applications. Obviously, ecosystems is something that you guys are probably quite in on. Um, but issues like drug delivery as well, if you can do some sort of active agent to do targeted drug delivery, um, this could actually have quite significant applications. Now, just to make sure I'm defining things properly, um, when we're talking about active tracers, I think it's important to distinguish from passive tracers. So a passive tracer is one that just follows the flow without deviating from the flow um, and also without feeding back on it. So obviously um, microspheres and molecular dyes versus an active tracer that deviates from the flow in some respect or sometimes feeds back and alters the flow itself. We're gonna be emphasizing the first issue here. And in particular, we're gonna be really talking about reaction fronts and self-propelled organisms in fluid flows. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend about, about 10 minutes talking about the reaction front problem. 
First of all, because it sets up everything we're going to be talking about later on with the swimming microbes, but also because it's very, very relevant um, for, in fact, I think some mi microscale ocean biophysics problems as well, um, in particular issues like plankton and stuff like that. So when we're talking about a front, ultimately, we need some sort of system that has two different states, state B and state A. So state B could be healthy trees and state A could be burned trees. Um, B could be healthy people and A could be sick people, um, or it could just be some sort of chemical reaction that turns from B to A. And the line between these two things is the front that we are looking at. So in the case of a forest fire, the front is actually the flame front that's sweeping through and burning up those trees. Now, I love this particular animated GIF. Um, this is uh, basically a, a, an animation showing how the bubonic plague swept through Europe in the mid 1300s. Um, and you got this remarkably smooth front that moved across the continent with the strange exception of what's going on in Krakow. And I actually do not know what's going on there. But I want to contrast this to how um, COVID a couple of years ago spread across the United States. So if you look at this movie here, what should be really obvious is that the behavior is very, very, very different in 2020 versus 1350. Now, the reason for this, I think, is pretty obvious. Um, people were not very mobile back in the 1300s, and now we've got cars, we have trains, airplanes. People are much more mobile. So it is because of mixing. Now, in this case, it's mixing of the population, but the idea still applies. So this kind of leads to this question of how are reaction fronts actually affected by fluid mixing? And again, there are lots and lots of applications. I want to emphasize again, if you're talking about plankton blooms, plankton, um, if you don't have a fluid flow, does actually produce fronts as the population grows. So um, here's the basic theory that we're going to be using um, for, for, for much of the talk. If we're talking about a reaction front, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a particular part of the reaction front, a little element of this. We're going to denote its x-coordinate, its y-coordinate, and we're also going to denote an angle that the a tangent to the front makes with respect to the horizontal. So we have three variables here, and if you put a reaction front in a fluid flow, it can either be carried by the fluid flow, it can actually propagate relative to the fluid, and it can also rotate, it can also be rotated by the fluid flow. So this results in this system of three ordinary differential equations for x, y, and theta of that reaction front. And I want to highlight the most important parameter here is this non-dimensional reaction speed. It's basically the speed at which the front moves um, in the absence of a fluid flow divided by kind of a typical flow speed. Um, later on in the talk, when we're talking about microbes, it's going to be the same thing, but it'll be the, the ratio of the swimming speed to the flow speed. So let's talk about a particular flow, and we're going to be spending most of the talk on this chain of vortices, basically alternating chain of vortices, different signs here. Um, and the idea now, and I'm going to describe what we mean by the manifolds here. So the idea is if we start with the simplest case first, so we're going to start with the passive case, um, no reaction fronts, um, no swimming, and we can identify the fixed points at the corners of the vortices where the fluid velocity is zero. And then there's the unstable manifold of this bottom fixed point, which is also the stable manifold of the top fixed point. That's the red curve here. This thing is basically isolating one vortex from the next. It's basically a barrier across which no passive tracers go in the absence of any sort of uh, diffusion. Now, if we now think about a chemical reaction in the same fluid flow, imagine that we're going to trigger a reaction at this bottom fixed point here like lighting a match to our fire. Of course, the reaction can move away from that fixed point in the unstable direction, but it can also propagate outward against the incoming fluid flow. And it does that until it reaches a point, which we call a burning fixed point, where the 
outgoing reaction speed and the incoming fluid speed are the same. And so the reaction front stops at that point. Now, in the same way that fixed points for the flow have what we call passive manifolds attached to them, these fixed points, these burning fixed points, have what we call uh, what we call burning invariant manifolds attached to them. And just like the passive manifold acts like a barrier, these things also act like a barrier, but there's an important difference. If I were to trigger reaction, say here, to the left of this red fixed point, as it moves to the right, when it reaches that point, now the react, oops, sorry, um, back. Let me back up. When, the, when it reaches that point, the reaction is going to the right, the flow is going to the right, so it goes right through. Similarly, reactions starting over here will go right through this manifold here. So the manifold actually has a direction in which it blocks the fronts. And we can see that in this simulation here done by uh, um, Kevin's postdoc. Basically, this simulation is kind of mapping out one of these burning invariant manifolds along with the direction at which it blocks. And then we're gonna uh, put a reaction front in here. I'm gonna run this video again so you can see it a little bit better here. Um, so this is the this is one of the Bernie invariant manifolds. There's another one in the opposite direction. Um, and you can see um, the direction at which it's blocking. I'm gonna pause this. So here's this part of the manifold is blocking inward. This part of the manifold is blocking outward. We trigger a reaction over here. The reaction, of course, can get carried by the fluid flow, but it's also going to grow because that's what reactions do. And you can see that when it reaches the burning invariant manifold, it stops cold on the part of the burning invariant manifold that blocks inward, but goes right through the one that blocks outward. That's how these things work. So they block only in one direction. Now, the cool thing about this is that if we take into account the fact that there's a burning invariant manifold on the other side as well, if you trigger a reaction in between the two of them, that reaction has to go all the way around before it can get into the centers of the vortices. So I'm going to show you some experiments now um, where we actually test these things here. For the experiments, what we're going to do is we're going to generate a chain of vortices. And the way we do this is using magneto hydrodynamic forcing techniques. Basically, we have a chain of alternating magnets underneath a box with a thin layer of an electrolytic fluid. It so happens that the uh, chemical reaction that we're using is electrolytic, so it makes things very convenient. We run a current through that fluid. That current interacts with the magnets, the alternating magnetic field, and generates this chain of vortices. It's a beautiful system, very easy to produce in the lab. Now, the chemical reaction that we're using is the excitable version of the belazov jabotinsky chemical reaction. And we can trigger it by dipping a silver wire into part of the fluid. It produces this pulse-like reaction front that propagates outward. And in fact, being excitable, it actually has the ability to reset itself and, uh, and trigger uh, right back again. This is kind of like a forest fire where the trees grow back so fast that you can burn them down a second time just a, just a couple of hours later. Um, this is what this looks like if we put this in the fluid flow. So now we've got this vortex flow and we're gonna trigger the reaction at that fixed point. You can see that the reaction kind of winds around before it goes in. And if you look at the contours, you can see that they basically pile up um, where this barrier is. And so we can actually look at this experimental result and compare it to the theory and see that, yeah, this picture of these things as barriers really does, in fact, work. Now, obviously, we haven't confined our experiments to just this one flow. We've also looked at uh, a fluid flow, which is basically a spatially disordered fluid flow. Um, we do this by just putting the magnets randomly in the box. Um, and this is what the flow looks like. And if we zoom in on a section of it, we can actually trigger a reaction um, in this part. And this is basically the outline of the reaction at a particular time. A little bit later, the outline looks like this. A little bit later, a little bit later, a little bit later. And what I hope you are noticing here is that the reaction is getting funneled through this region, but not penetrating through this or through that. And so we can actually identify those as barriers that are keeping the reaction front from, from moving outward. So here's the question. 
are these things in fact burning invariant manifolds? If they are, then they should be one-way barriers and we can test that. So here's two additional experiments where we triggered the reaction on different sides here. You'll see this one goes right through the first one and stops at the second. This one goes right through that one and stops at the second as well. So yes, these things are in fact acting as one-way barriers as is expected by this burning invariant manifold theory. And then if we zoom back on the entire flow, what we can do is we can identify these little segments, these little pieces of burning invariant manifolds that act as barriers. In this movie, the red segments block downward fronts, the green segments block upward fronts. And I want you to watch what happens when it hits one of these things. It's like hitting a solid wall. Um, it has to go all the way around these barriers here. So these things, even though there's no physical barrier in the flow, these things are really acting almost like brick walls that are stopping the reaction fronts here. So one of our arguments, and this is something we're still working on, um, is that if you want to understand how reaction fronts move through a flow, and as I'm gonna be showing you, this is applies to so many microbes as well. If you wanna understand how these things move through the flow, you gotta understand this kind of structure, this kind of skeleton for the front propagation process here. Now, we've studied this in a bunch of other uh, two-dimensional fluid flows, including arrays of vortices with a uniform wind. We've looked at um, propagating individual vortices. We've looked at three-dimensional fluid flows. In this case, these barriers, these manifolds become these kind of scroll-like or tube-like structures. The bottom line is that this theory works very, very, very well for a wide range of two-dimensional and three-dimensional fluid flows. So this is kind of the the background, the reaction front background, um, this idea that these Bernie invariant manifolds work very well to um, as one-way barriers. So now I want to switch gears. And now we're going to talk about swimming or self-propelled tracers. And again, at first glance, these may seem like very different problems, but they really, really aren't. Um, this is a particular movie. I should turn off the sound on this. Um, that I took at the beach, um, uh, which is a really good example of uh, an active tracer moving in a fluid flow. This is basically a bird at the beach, which is experiencing significant French fry taxes. Um, basically, the bird is clearly flying to the right, but it's not really going anywhere because there's a very strong wind going to the left as well. And so I, I find this a very visual example of of the interaction between a self-propelled object um, and some sort of a, some sort of external flow. I'm going to turn the sound back on just in case you guys want to talk. Um, so the theory is very, very similar to what I showed you before. So instead of looking at a little piece of a reaction front, now we're going to look at a, an, an ellipsoidal swimmer, kind of a physicist model of a swimmer here. Um, and as was the case for the reaction front, you put one of these things in a fluid flow, and it can get carried by the flow, it can swim relative to the fluid, or it can get rotated by the flow. Um, so you end up with almost the same set of differential equations with one difference. And the one difference is that we have to take into account the shape of the organism. So we can define the aspect ratio, which is this length divided by that length. And from that, we can define alpha, um, and alpha equals one corresponds to a long, skinny um, micro that swims along its, its longest direction. Alpha equals zero would be a circular or a spherical um, swimmer. Alpha equals negative one would be a very long, skinny thing that swims perpendicular to its major axis. And by the way, if any of you are aware of anything in nature um, that actually swims with alpha equals negative one, I would, I would love to hear about it. I don't think nature does that very much, um, but as we're gonna see, alpha equals negative one is very, 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 very relevant. First of all, because alpha equals negative one is the front propagation problem. So if you put negative one in here, you get exactly the same equations that we had for the front propagation problem. And as I'm gonna talk about later on, alpha equals negative one, it also gives, describes kind of the ultimate barriers for tumbling organisms, which is really, really cool. So um, the key idea then, is that pretty much everything I just talked about for reaction fronts 
should apply for self-propelled tracers as well. So here's a video um, in the um, vortex chain flow of a bunch of swimmers um, moving in this flow. This red curve is the swimming invariant manifold rather than burning invariant manifold. Um, and you can see once again that these things do not go through in the blocking direction, but they can easily go through in the opposite direction. Again, these things are one-way barriers. Now, the swimming invariant manifolds are actually these kinds of sheet-like structures in a three-dimensional phase space, basically x, y, and the swimming direction here. Um, what we've shown here is the unstable swimming invariant manifold of that fixed point in red, the stable swimming invariant manifold of this fixed point in green, and what we're displaying in the XY projection is what um, Kevin likes to call swim edges. Basically, if you kind of follow in this tube-like structure, kind of the farthest away you can go, that basically maps out the swim edge. And it's the swim edge that's the one-way barrier. Now, let's talk about the experiments. So once again, we're going to do a chain of vortices. This time, it's going to be smaller. We're going to do a one millimeter channel. We're actually going to image these with a microscope. We're going to put a, a pattern of alternating magnets underneath it. We're going to run an electrical current through the fluid in the channel. Um, and that current is going to interact with the magnetic field to produce this alternating forcing, which if we have barriers on the side, um, produces our chain of vortices. And we can do some velocimetry. This is what the velocity field looks like for some of the vortices in that vortex chain. Now, the organisms that we're going to look at, um, we're going to start by talking about tetraselmus, which is a marine algae. Um, and uh, tetraselmus is really nice for these experiments because we need to run an electrical current. And this is great because they're, they're very happy in salt water. Um, and um, they're not quite perfectly circular, but they're pretty close to it. So we, we estimate alpha to be about 0.3 for these organisms here. So this is what these guys look like in our experiment if there is no imposed flow. These two movies are the same thing. The only difference is that in this bottom movie, we're not erasing between the uh, images so you can see the paths here. Um, but the tetraselmus in many cases will actually undergo fairly smooth trajectories. Not always, you can see some wiggling um, because they tend to kind of swim in spiraling motion. Um, if we put these, if we put the flow on, now you can really see the vortices um, uh, um, that are being imposed here. But clearly, these guys are not passive tracers because they're crossing from one vortex to the next. They're cross, their paths are crossing over each other, crossing over itself. So there's clearly kind of a combination of the flow and the swimming behavior. Now we can pull out some of the trajectories, and in these images that I'm going to show you. The black curve is the path, and these red segments are showing you the swimming direction. So for this guy, it starts in one vortex. Um, when it gets near the boundary, it's swimming to the right. So that swimming carries it into the next vortex, gets caught up in a loop, and when it comes out, it's now swimming to the left, so it can cross back over into that first vortex. A um, Couple of common features. We often see loops in these trajectories, and it's interesting, the loops are, are accompanied typically by a rotation of 180 degrees in the swimming direction. This guy here, it comes in swimming to the right, comes out swimming to the left. If you look at this guy here, it goes into the loop swimming upward, it comes out swimming downward. That's a very common feature. And there's also these cusp-like structures as well, um, corresponding to tumbling, uh, basically rotation by the fluid, where once again, there's a, a 180 degree flip in the, uh, in the swimming direction. That's actually kind of cool because if you recall the uh, earlier simulation I was showing you of the burning invariant manifolds, this kind of cusp-like structure shows up in the burning invariant manifolds all the time. And so this is an example of, of a common feature between what we saw with the reaction fronts and what we're seeing now with the swimming organisms. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at how these swimmers go from one vortex to the next. And we're gonna take advantage of the symmetry of the flow. We're gonna look at every 
trajectory that crosses over any vortex boundary. So let's say we're looking at, um, say, uh, one's crossing this vortex. We're going to subtract two vortex widths to line these up with that. These guys here, we're going to subtract one vortex width and flip them vertically. And then we can do the same thing for, for um, tracers crossing over a vortex boundary to the left. The net result is that we can display all of these things as though they're happening at the same time, even though I want to emphasize these tracers that I'm, these um, tetracelmas that I'm showing you here, this is not all happening at the same time. We've combined all the data. But by doing this, you can see if we plot this swim edge predicted from the theory, you can see that it does a really good job of stopping these things mostly um, from crossing over to the right. But if we start with tetracelmas that are already to the right of them, they pass right through that structure. And again, this is experimental data that I'm showing you here. So this is, um, I think, pretty clear evidence that yes, the theory works, that these things really are acting as one-way barriers. Now we can go a little farther. So we can also sort these things by this non-dimensional swimming speeds, basically the speed at which they swim in the absence of a flow divided by the maximum fluid velocity. Um, this is, sorry, um, this is for a case where um, the swimming speed is about two tenths of the maximum flow velocity. And we're looking at all the trajectories that cross um, this, uh, um, this vortex boundary. And we can plot basically the unstable swimming invariant manifold of this, this fixed point and the stable swimming invariant manifold of that, of that one. You can see these things are kind of acting as good boundaries here. But what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to do some tricks here. We're going to take advantage of the symmetry, take everything to the left of the dotted line and flip it vertically. And when we do that, basically what we are doing here is we are showing what this would look like if you released a bunch of tracers in between these two manifolds, between these two swim edges. And you can see they kind of go up and around. If we increase the non-dimensional swimming speed, these manifolds are farther apart, but it's still you still have the same sort of behavior. So I want to show you again, comparing this to what we saw before with the reaction fronts that we see the same kind of behavior, these manifolds acting as barriers around which either the reaction or the swimmers have to go. Now, there's more that we can do. This is a simulation of the motion of microbes in this flow. And I wanna emphasize, this is a two-dimensional time-independent flow. If these tracers were passive, they wouldn't go anywhere. But since they can swim, there is um, uh, transport from one vortex to the next. So the question is, does the swimming invariant manifold formalism give us any insight into how organisms go from one vortex to the next? The answer is yes. So going back to this picture of these manifolds in three dimensions, if you look at the unstable manifold in red of this fixed point and the stable manifold of that fixed point in green, these things join together to form a structure that we call a chute that basically carries the microbes from one vortex to the next. Now, this is the chute that shows microbes going from the left to the right. There's actually another one that's taking things from the right to the left, but we have not shown that in this image just to make it a little bit easier to see. So here's the deal. What we can do is we can actually plot basically cross sections of that chute, both in X and Y, and also in X and theta at different values of Y. And you can see for small swimming speeds, basically everything that's crossing the vortex boundary is confined by this chute. As we increase the swimming speeds, the chutes get bigger, and they still do a good job of describing how things get from one vortex to the next. Um, so the bottom line here is that this really does show us the mechanism behind how you can get transport from one vortex to the next vortex. Um, now, we can go a little farther. We can do a very quick kind of estimate as to what we would expect the flux to be by basically taking a cross-sectional slice of this chute at, um, the, at the midpoint. Um, and what we have here is this blue region is the cross-sectional area of the chute taking things to the right, the yellow region is the cross section of um, the other chute, which I haven't shown you, that takes microbes to the left. Um, 
And uh, um, so basically anything in this middle shoot is going to go from the left to the right. Anything in the in this yellow shoot is going to go from the right to the left. Um, I'm not going to go into details about the mathematics of this, but basically by looking at the um, the sizes of these cross-sectional areas, we can predict what the flux is going to be. And we can measure the flux experimentally simply by just counting how many microbes cross over from one vortex to the next in a certain period of time. So the red dots here are all um, the, the, the locations of tracers that eight tenths of a second later will be in the next vortex. The blue dots are the locations of tracers that 1.6 seconds later will be in the next vortex. And when we actually plot the uh, flux versus time and compare that with the predictions, the predictions are the lines, the predictions based on these shoots, we get a, a pretty decent agreement, despite the fact that there are some simplifying assumptions here. Most significant is that we are assuming that the density of the microbes in phase space is uniform, which is not necessarily true. You can have density variations. And if I have time, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, I think I've got 10 minutes left in the talk here. Um, so um, here's the next thing I want to talk about. So another cool thing about, about active mixing is that you can get chaos in flows where you would not normally expect chaotic mixing. So you need three dimensions in phase space to get chaos. So if you're talking about passive mixing, that means either you have to have a three-dimensional fluid flow, so X, Y, and Z is the dimensions, or two dimensions and time dependence, so T would be the third dimension. But active tracers, the, the direction of the swimming is a third dimension. So you can get chaos even for a two-dimensional time-independent flow, um, which I think is really, really cool here. So one of the questions is, can we see evidence of this? Um, Numerically, it's very easy to see that you can get chaos in these cases. So um, Kevin and one of his postdocs did a, um, did, did, wrote a paper a couple of years ago where they were identifying both what they called trap trajectories and escaping trajectories in a vortex array. The trap trajectories are basically ordered. The escaping trajectories are basically chaotic. Um, and what we've done is we've done some simulations to really verify that, yes, this really is chaos. We're looking at three tracers all starting from the same initial location, but very, very, very slight difference in their initial swimming angle here. And you can see they follow each other for a while, but then take off in completely different patterns, exactly what you would expect of sensitive dependence on initial conditions for chaotic motion. Now, here's one of the experimental trajectories. This is one trajectory. This one really stood out because you can see it comes right back to almost exactly the same location in space. And when we actually look at the angle as well, it turns out that it came back to almost exactly the same um, swimming direction as well. So we can actually plot these two segments of the trajectory and you see they follow each other for a while, but then they diverge and go off in completely different directions. Again, exactly what we would expect for chaotic behavior here. So we can actually plot the separation of those tra trajectories versus time, plot this semi-logarithmically. You get what looks like um, coarse-grained exponential separation as to what you would, again, what you would expect if it were, in fact, chaotic behavior. Now, this is very preliminary. Um, of course, there's always the question about whether we're seeing exponential separation because of deterministic chaos or whether there's noise in the swimming that's doing that. Um, also, what we would love to be able to do is actually make a field of finite time Lyapunov exponents from the experimental data to see if we can identify regions in the flow where the, where the motion is not chaotic. So that takes us to the next issue here. Um, and this is quite interesting here because there are parameters. Basically, if you look at the shape parameter and the non-dimensional swimming speed, um, Kevin and Simon have done some theories on this and have found that in this white region of parameter space, every trajectory is chaotic. But if you go down into the black region, there are some of these ordered islands as well. So at the same system where you get chaotic motion, you can have ordered motion as well. And that's actually something we can see experimentally, at least qualitatively. If we look at 
a um, trajectory of, a, of, well, this is actually two trajectories of swimmers that are swimming down in this region here, you can see in green a trapped trajectory that looks like an order trajectory. Whereas if we increase the swimming speed, we find that we don't find any of these trapped trajectories, again, consistent with the theory. And an, another really cool thing about this is we can actually look at the variance of a spreading distribution of these tracers. And what we find is if we're looking at tracers with swimming speeds that are up in this chaotic band here, we find basically enhanced diffusive transport. Whereas if we look down in this region where we get ordered, ordered islands as well, the um, transport tends to be subdiffusion where it's growing slower than linearly in time. And that's actually something that can be understood that's something that can be understood um, because those ordered islands can, can cause sticking of the trajectories, which gives rise to subdiffusion. Now, another thing that we're interested in, and I mentioned this earlier, um, it turns out that alpha equals negative one not only corresponds to the front propagation problem, but alpha equals negative one also corresponds to the case of tumbling and noisy trajectories. And the way of thinking about this is if you have a swarm of microbes that are all swimming in very random directions here, they're effectively feeling out every kind of path you can get, which is exactly what's going on with front propagation. So we're doing some experiments in a vortex array flow. Um, and when you look at the burning invariant manifolds, this is now for alpha equals negative one or for fronts, um, if you have a small non-dimensional front propagation or swimming speed, these manifolds are very close together, whereas for a larger non-dimensional speed, the manifolds are farther apart. So if we now imagine a reaction front moving through here, um, for the small non-dimensional speed, they're bounded by these manifolds. So it has to kind of squeeze through this very narrow passage, and you end up with these very thin structures, whereas if the swimming speed or the front propagation speed is larger, these things are farther apart, there's more space, you get these fatter structures. So um, if we're looking at swimming microbes, what happens is for small non-dimensional swimming speed, they have to follow this very tortured path to get through, whereas for higher non-dimensional swimming speed, they can take a shortcut. Um, so we're doing experiments uh, on this as well. Um, these are experiments which are actually only about a week old. They're very, very new. Um, this is a laboratory scale system with um, brine shrimp in their larval stage. They're about a half a millimeter in size. Um, this is what they look like um, in the absence of any fluid flow. So the brine shrimp uh, have very, very noisy swimming. Uh, if we look at these things in a vortex array flow, you can see the evidence of the vortices in the flow. But again, clearly these aren't passive tracers because they're crossing from one vortex to the next. Um, they're crossing over each other. So there's a combination of both swimming and um, the flow. Um, this is the same, um, the same data, but what we've done is we've sorted it by the non-dimensional swimming speed and we've translated everything to make it look as though every trajectory is starting from the same vortex here. And you can see again, kind of the vortex structure in the flow. What I wanna do though is really point out that if we compare the cases with small swimming speed to larger swimming speeds, you can see the manifolds. You can see these structures that I've been showing you all throughout the talk here. And notice these structures are thicker for the fatter swimmers, again, exactly as expected. So compare these structures to what we see for reaction fronts in the same flow. Again, small non-dimensional speed, you get thin structures, large non-dimensional speed, you get these fat structures um, instead. And I like to point out, if you take a look back at this um, bloom of cyanobacteria in the Baltic Sea, take a look at this structure here and compare it with what we're seeing in the experiments. It's really cool when you see these kinds of structures that we're doing in our very simple lab experiments, and yet they show up um, in real life flows as well. Um, Richard, how much time do I have left? Or should I, should I wrap up? A uh, couple of minutes. Okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the I'm gonna do the two minute. Oh, ha, I forgot to, forgot to mention this. Um, this is actually quite interesting. We can actually predict how fast these fronts should be moving. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap up in about two or three minutes. Um, we can figure out 
We can predict how fast these guys are moving by looking at the shape of the interface. Basically, L is the perimeter of the corrugated front, and L0 would be the perimeter of a, of, of a circle with, a, with the average radius of this. The radius, the ratio of those two predicts what the front speed should be. And this is something that we are working on right now to actually measure these perimeters and test this. Again, this comes back to the manifolds because the corrugation of the front is determined by the burning invariant manifold um, structure. Now, um, I only have about two minutes left. I wanna just give you a kind of a very, very, very brief overview of some other experiments that we're doing um, in a hyperbolic flow with the flow coming in in the vertical and going out along the horizontal in a, in a PDMS cross channel. In the center region, this actually is described very well as a hyperbolic flow. And we can compare both Tetraselmus and Euglena. Euglena are much longer and are closer to an alpha equal one. So the, these experiments give us the ability to really look at the, um, the effects of the shape of the organism. Key thing about this is that when we put in the equations for a hyperbolic flow, this equation for theta dot basically depends strongly on the shape parameter. If you're talking about something that's circular with alpha equals zero, theta dot will be zero everywhere in the flow. So there's nothing that's gonna reorient, reorient um, uh, one of those tracers. Whereas if alpha is equal to one, theta dot is not equal to zero and they in fact do end up aligning with the flow. So this is what the Euglena look like when we put these in the hyperbolic flow. This is what the Tetraselmus look like when we put these guys in the hyperbolic flow. And one thing I really wanna point out here is look at the difference in the distribution of the angles. This is the distribution of angles along the outflow. And the Euglena with alpha close to one really line up with the flow, whereas the Tetraselmus have a much broader a much broader distribution of angles. So it's um, this is a really good system for comparing this. I'm not going to go into details. Um, we can look at the, the swimming invariant manifolds. Um, trust me, the picture works beautifully in this system as well. If anybody's curious, I can go back and look at the, uh, go back and show you the evidence about this. But the swimming invariant manifolds work well in this case as well. So let me wrap up because I know Richard wants me to finish. Um, so going back to this question, of how is a swimming microbe like a forest fire? Well, there's a number of different, uh, different common things here. One is that both fronts and self-propelled tracers move relative to the fluid, so we can think of them both as active. Um, the same theoretical framework works for the two. In fact, the front propagation problem is a special case of the general theory for self-propelled tracers. And in fact, the BIMs, the burning invariant manifolds for reaction fronts, are ultimate barriers for swimming microbes of any shape, and even if they are noisy, tumbling swimmers. And then of course, both of them are characterized by these one-way barriers. Um, there is, uh, so the key takeaway is this idea that these manifolds are really kind of a universal property of active mixing problems. Um, and of course, there's a hell of a lot of work that we are continuing to do on these problems here. Um, but I think at this point, I should stop because I know you guys wanted to leave some time for questions. Um, so um, at this point, if anybody has any questions, I'd be delighted to take them. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Um, yeah, floor's open. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and just go ahead. Hello, Tom. Thank you for a very engaging talk. It's really Thanks. nice. Uh, I have a question about uh, whether you thought uh, about whether these um, burning, burning manifolds could act as um, sort of protected areas. Uh, if I imagine some kind of predator and prey interaction, uh, the combination of something swimming and non-swimming could be protected if one locates oneself uh, in a certain region. That's a fascinating question. Um, that's a fascinating question. Uh, and it is something we have been thinking about. Um, it's interesting. When you look at burning invariant manifolds, it turns out that the um, um, that the blocking direction you, you you'll never get a burning invariant manifold that in completely encircles a region, um, uh, but you can get pretty close to that. So you can have a situation where it's not going to permanently protect a region, but it's going to really 
um, hold things up back quite a bit. And it's interesting because a year ago, we were actually in Yosemite National Park in the United States, and they were talking about, about wildfires that they get there. And you can have these wildfires that sweep through and burn down entire forests, and yet they'll leave like one house or one section completely unburned. Um, and so I'm looking at this stuff and I'm thinking, you know, I wonder if the way the winds were blowing was perhaps producing at least kind of a segment of a burning invariant manifold that at least long enough was protecting that particular house or that particular region. Of course, conspiracy theorists say it's all because of space lasers and their people are pur purposely protecting their own houses or whatever. Um, the interesting thing is that if you if you look at swimming microbes, um, now we're going to move away from alpha equals negative one. It turns out that with swimming microbes, you actually can get a swimming invariant manifold that actually does completely encircle a region. Um, so, so theoretically, that is possible. Now, having said that, remember, um, the theory is only basically for smooth swimmers. So if you have any sort of organisms that have the ability to change their swimming direction, then you have to go back to the alpha equals negative one case. Um, uh, there's still barriers, um, but it's not going to completely encircle a region, but you can get some temporary protection. So I think that's a really, really interesting question um, and something I would love for people who are doing e ecosystem stuff to see if there's any evidence of that kind of stuff in real life systems. I think that's a really interesting question. Thank uh, you. I have a question. Okay. Uh, so I'm trying to relate your very interesting modeling with our modeling of similar questions. So um, we've been uh, using as a model system microscopic marine larvae yes. um, of animals that are swimmers and also copepods that are trying to do vertical migration. And um, we do some of our modeling in um, uh, theoretical 3D turbulence, you know, we yes. put the model in that. And we do other modeling in um, actual PIV data that we have for turbulent benthic boundary layers. And we have also the concentration distributions of chemicals that the organisms respond to um, done by this technique called PLIF. So we either are embedding our model in real data or in a turbulence model. And we can um, look at um, uh, things that sink, things that actively swim, different body shapes, that sort of thing. And one thing that I think is similar to what you saw that I just was going to tell you is one question we ask as biologists is, why should you bother to swim if you swim more slowly than the water around you? Yeah, that's and a really What we find question. is with swimmers, uh, because um, the local shear uh, changes your swimming direction, uh, you can cover more territory in a period of time by going from one vortex to the next. Yeah. So it's exactly what you found, but our uh, models are agent-based models. So at every time step, the organism is rotated by the local um, vorticity, it's swimming relative to the fluid and it's being carried in the fluid. So it's exactly the things where you started. Um, but uh, we find, of course, if you're ellipsoidal, and this may be what yours are doing, you're Absolutely. rotated by the local shear until you're aligned with the shear, and then you stop rotating. And yeah. so long things end up in different places in the turbulence than um, uh, spherical things. Um, and we've also found that if organisms have behaviors like they stop swimming and start sinking when the chemical that they're in gets above a certain concentration, then they can bias how the ambient flow carries them to the substratum. Yeah. And uh, the copepods uh, can surf on the turbulence and greatly enhance uh, the velocity that they move up or down. That's work that I did with uh, Christophe Eloy and some of his uh, students. And so I'm trying to relate our models, which are kind of dumb. We have the turbulence, we put the agents in, and then we follow all the agents yeah. with your more general overview. So I wondered which of the elements that we're looking at are also covered by your sort of more overview model. 
By the way, I was mentioning to Richard uh, earlier that I'm, I'm actually hoping to visit uh, your research group in the spring. Um, this is a, a great example of why I would love to have long conversations with you about this. Um, I, I, I absolutely love the work that you guys are doing in these systems here. Um, just beautiful, beautiful work. Um, this issue about kind of relating the models. So, so, so we're we're kind of in different different flow regimes. So um, in our case, we're really looking at the very, very, very simplest flows, very laminar flows, where we can basically um, uh, write down these series of differential equations very simply. Um, and a really fascinating question, of course, is how does this scale up to more complicated systems? How does this scale up to more complicated flows? Um, I, I was already talking a little bit about this issue about what if we take into account the fact that the organisms can uh, can change the swimming direction, but this is just the tip of the iceberg because we haven't even talked about chemotaxis, um, uh, phototaxis, magnetotaxis, other things that can kind of influence the swimming of this stuff. So our model is the absolute, absolute simplest case you can look at um, um, in these kinds of situations. And yet, I, I'm, I, I'm, I would really love to kind of continue these conversations here. One of the questions that we're very interested in is, how far can we push this to more realistic systems? Um, and uh, I think that's a really interesting question. So for instance, let's say you're talking about a turbulent flow. At first glance, you would think turbulent flow, how are you gonna get manifolds out of this? Well, one approach uh, um, and uh, pioneered by another person at ETH, uh, George Haller has been looking at these things called Lagrangian coherent structures, where what they can do is they can take turbulent flows um, and um, they're not exactly manifolds, but they're kind of the generalization of manifolds to more uh, more difficult, more turbulent flows. And they can actually identify these things as local barriers as well. And so um, that's all for passive mixing. So our hunch here is that these kinds of manifolds that we're seeing may be able to be generalizable to more complicated flows um, using kind of a similar sort of approach but that's something that still needs to be worked out um, uh, in, in, in a lot more detail. Um, the questions you've asked, uh, that's a huge Pandora's box of all sorts <laughs> of interesting questions. Um, and uh, um, great, great questions. Um, uh, and I think it's this really, frankly, I think these are the most interesting questions because ultimately we want to be able to see if, if these kinds of very simplistic theories can apply to these more, co these more complicated systems. Um, so, Another option here, um, let's say you have a turbulent flow, but there are large coherent structures. So maybe you have a large vor vor vortex patch embedded in a turbulent flow. Um, it's possible that these kinds of manifolds may still show up in that kind of thing. I mean, the picture that I showed you of that cyanobacteria bloom, that's clearly a turbulent flow, and yet you still see these structures here. And so there must be some large coherent patches of vorticity in the ocean, in the, in the flows there. Yeah, I'll just... Propose that's a very interesting um, issue. Lots of organisms that are suspension feeders that capture planktonic organisms have uh, vortices in their wakes as the ambient flow goes by. And it'd be interesting to see if that's a mechanism for concentrating the prey. We have always thought about it as they have many uh, chances to catch the prey because they're trapped there. So it'd be interesting to to think about that question using your approach. I I agree. Um, I agree. And uh, honestly, like I said, there's there's so many things in your question. Uh, there are so many interesting aspects to your question that I could spend hours um, talking about. <laughs> so I shouldn't hog you. <laughs> no, it's it's it's, it's they're, they're wonderful questions. And like I said, I'm I'm hoping to actually get out to Switzerland, um, and then we can talk talk in in uh, in, in more detail about this. But no, those are those are really, really interesting questions. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a quick one. Um, I won't go down the Lagrangian the coherent structure route because we'll, we'll be here all day otherwise. Um, yeah. But for the, uh, for the for the swimming invariant manifolds, have we thought about the effects of um, jamming against the boundary? Because uh, so when you have your when you have them collecting up against the, the one way barrier, and they can't come through. And yes. you get a high densification there. Um, like with bacteria, for example, then you get into like an active turbulence regime, for example. Um, have you thought about how like the jamming of cells around these uh, barriers are coming to play? Because then you you'll find almost like a physical 
blow so up on top of the situations, balloon. You're talking about situations where you have a large enough concentration of the of the of the microbes that they can actually jam into each other. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Like a jamming uh, machine, yeah. Yeah, so so uh, I will tell you, we actually haven't done any experiments on this yet. Um, everything I've shown you is in the dilute regime where the uh, where there's very little interaction between the organisms. Even though the movie I showed you showed a swarm of them, those were all at very, very different times here. Um, we have been interested in the question of collective behavior um, and uh, um, how um, these manifolds might affect that. Because if you're talking about, now this isn't so much a question of jamming, but if you're talking about cooperative or collective behavior, presumably the different organisms would, would have to have some sort of mechanism of communicating with each other. And if you had a situation where you had kind of a swarm of these microbes and a manifold went through the swarm, that could basically interrupt the communication mechanism and prevent them from doing some sort of collective behavior. Now that's not jamming though. Um, uh, if you're talking about jamming, by the way, again, lots of, lots of interesting things in your question here. Um, there's kind of two issues here that I can think of at the moment. One is the process by which they come together in the first place. Um, and uh, so that's certainly gonna be something where the shape is gonna matter because if we're talking about circular objects, theoretically, if there's no chemotaxis or phototaxis or any sort of taxis, the density is gonna remain uniform. But if you talk about a non-circular structure, you can end up with density variations, um, uh, significant density variations. Um, and so an interesting question as to whether these manifolds could potentially break up that, uh, that process of these things becoming more dense. Um, as to the jamming themselves, once they actually get there, um, I, I can imagine, you know, once you, when you're talking about a jam structure here, now you're talking about something that's extended and if it's extending past on either side of these manifolds, then certainly that's going to have an effect on the behavior. Um, that's something I'd have to think about a little bit more, a little bit more detail. This, you're the first person that's asked about jamming in the system, which is yeah. Because I was thinking of it from a sense of these barriers could act as a way of like enhancing aggregate formation, for example, if you're encouraging encounters and collisions in certain areas. Absolutely. Um, and by the way, an interesting thing about this is if you're thinking about, say, one of these one-way barriers, let, let's say you're imagining kind of a, a loop of one of these barriers here. If it's blocking inward, then what you can have is this: the manifolds themselves can actually contribute to the density variations because you can have a situation where if I, let, let, let's say I've got um, a, a manifold and I'm going to make it simple and just make this a manifold that's a circle that's blocking inward. If I start off with a uniform distribution of tracers, the ones that are inside can get out, but the ones that are outside can't get in. So over time, the center part's gonna hollow out and the part outside is gonna become more dense. So this kind of structure can actually lead to density variations. Um, and if you're talking about jamming, that actually absolutely could have an effect. That absolutely could have an effect, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, interesting, interesting question. So I know it's 12 o'clock. Actually, I guess it's six o'clock your time. Yeah, um, end of the day. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have anything else to to ask? No. Well, in that case, uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming. Very that. interesting it's talk. It's been um, I love the questions too. Yeah, I will make sure you get on the mailing list uh, so yes. you can see your future things. Have us. And, um, yeah, as always. So the next seminar, we're not having one in August. We're having a little break. Um, but the next seminar will be September 19th uh, with a talk by Professor Andrew Palmer from the Florida Institute of Technology. Um, so have a good summer, everyone. Uh, enjoy the outdoors if you can. And we'll see you all back in September. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you, Tom. Thanks.